Hi guys, uh, I guess it's good time to start. Uh, we have swelled up in numbers. Uh, thank you all for uh, taking time of your busy schedules and uh, joining us with, in this webinar. Uh, uh, this is BrowseTech Originals, uh, the second edition. Uh, uh, so I'm sure some of you must have seen the first edition where uh, our co-founders talked about the founding journey of BrowseTech, how it took, uh, how it came into picture and how uh, you know they built the organization. Uh, in the second uh, edition of BrowseTech Originals, what we're going to cover today, we are going to talk about BrowseTech's technical journey uh, and what happened behind the scenes. Uh, it's been a roller coaster ride in trying to uh, you know build BrowseTech's tech. And we'll be uh, focusing on the mobile engineering uh, aspect of this technical journey mainly. Uh, if you want to map my voice to a face, I'm the guy on the right, uh, Akshay Minocha, an engineering manager with BrowStack. Uh, before we start, there are a couple of points. Uh, this webinar is being recorded live and will be shared with the registered participants after the session is over. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I'm being joined by Nakul, David and Dimil, who are part of the senior leadership, uh, technical leadership at BrowStack. And we'll be uh, discovering, deep diving, and having a great conversation and banter around uh, BrowStack's tech journey. Uh, just give me one second. I'll just go over quickly uh, over the agenda. So the first point being me introducing and giving you guys an overview of BrowStack, just to bring all of you on the same page, uh, telling you where we stand and uh, you know how our journey has been. Uh, we move on from there to uh, where I introduce you to Nakul, who is our C2 and co-founder. Uh, he'll be talking about, uh, uh, in his keynote address, he'll be talking about his uh, journey, his vision, and uh, you know what are the uh, couple of challenges that uh, he's faced and what excites him uh, in this journey uh, with BrowserStack. Uh, then we are going to move on to the uh, main content of this webinar, where we are going to have a fireside conversation with David and Dhimil, and we're going to deep dive into how uh, BrowStack's journey around mobile engineering and infrastructure setups has been, and technical challenges and everything around it. Uh, later on, we move on to the Q&A part, uh, after all these three things are over. Uh, it'll be a dedicated session. However, you guys can raise questions uh, in the Q&A section on the you know, Zoom uh, window, and uh, we guys uh, would be, uh, answering to the best of our ability during the Q&A session, uh, if time permits. Uh, I'll quickly move on to the part uh, where uh, we talk about BrowStack's history. Uh, it's been almost 10 years since uh, BrowStack came into picture. Uh, Nakul and Ritesh, uh, the co-founders of the company, uh, were serial entrepreneurs at that time and were working on a startup of their own when they came across this idea that they wanted to test out a website on a browser and that's how uh, they launched browser stack uh, with Internet Explorer as the first uh, offering. Uh, soon, browser stack had a thousand customers in another six months, and then uh, it's been uh, onwards and upwards since then. Uh, we launched Automate uh, a couple uh, a year down the line, which is uh, our uh, automation framework where people can test their uh, uh, testing suites. And uh, uh, after that, it's been uh, a ride where we moved on from desktop browsers and went, ventured into the space of uh, mobile devices. We launched Android and iOS physical devices and different kind of products uh, related to the app testing phase uh, uh, apart from browser testing. Uh, when all these products and features were coming into picture, there were a lot of uh, growth and expansion and we needed uh, uh, to expand globally in terms of data centers. Uh, very recently, we also uh, acquired uh, Percy. Percy is now a part of the BrowStack family, and uh, Percy is into the visual testing phase, and uh, it aligns with the BrowStack's uh, idea of becoming the leader in uh, the big uh, testing infrastructure of the internet. Uh, cut to just last month, we crossed the milestone of having 750 employees uh, who are part of the BrowStack family. Uh, we have uh, in excess of uh, 25,000 enterprise customers uh, who belong to different domains, uh, pretty much uh, all. And uh, uh, th th this is a list of customers who uh, are a couple of uh, you know, highlighted names uh, in our user list. Uh, 
Uh, we also power the internet. There are more than 1800 open source uh, technologies that are tested on browser stack. Uh, and since they are so uh, powerful and impactful, this just reinforces our idea that we are the industry re leaders in what we do. Uh, I'll talk about our scale. Uh, we are currently around 2 million registered users uh, who use browser stack and these uh, this combined number is actually running in excess of around 72 billion Selenium commands a year on our infrastructure. Uh, when we have this scale of users that are so, uh, uh, you know, distributed globally, uh, they are in uh, more than 135 different countries uh, where we have our customer station. And uh, when there is such a demand, we would want to uh, service all these customers in a very uh, you know, happy manner uh, with uh, low latency and, uh, you know, uh, a good product experience. And that's how we come to the point where we uh, are expanding globally in terms of data centers. And we have 15 uh, global data centers at this moment. Uh, yeah, I will move on to introduce Nakul Agarwal, uh, who's the CTO and co-founder of uh, BrowStack. Uh, Nakul, it'll be great if you can share a couple of points around the, your vision uh, and where the company is heading and the kind of challenges that excite you and how's the journey been. Uh, it'll be great if you can, uh, you know, uh, introduce and kickstart this event right now. Thanks, Akshay. Thanks for the uh, sweet introduction to Rao Stack and myself. Uh, so quick recap from, uh, sorry, hello everyone. And I hope everyone is keeping safe in the current COVID times. Uh, Quick recap, uh, I think we spoke about it in the Stack originals, me and Ritesh went at length talking about our journey. Uh, it all started in coffee shop building our, uh, I think doing our third gig. And we had an argument over who will do the, who will do the testing in iBrowser, browser, which was pretty painful back then at least. Uh, and that's where the, we launched, we built the product to solve the problem of testing in IE. Uh, I think along the journey and looking at, uh, looking back 10 years, I think we expanded into uh, all the browsers, all the platforms, and complete suite of infrastructure, uh, including mobile devices, and of course, expanding to product lines as well. Uh, I think the mission uh, where we started from still remains the same, which is enabling engineers to do more, not just build great experiences, but uh, I think uh, help them be more productive as well by reducing their build times and uh, letting them focus on their core business problems and not be worried about building their own testing infrastructure. Right. Uh, and which leads us to where we want to be, what the vision is. I think we want to be the test infrastructure of the internet. What that essentially means is whenever any engineer is raising a pull request uh, or on a commit, depending upon how you run your test suites, uh, if you need an infrastructure on that pull request, we want to uh, browse stack there, right? Uh, what that means for us uh, as browse stack is of course become, uh, expand our existing products, be the leader in this space uh, and Ex leads to two other dimensions. One is expanding our infrastructure uh, into other uh, other opportunities uh, as because internet is getting consumed in all new different uh, places uh, as uh, I think we are progressing. And also means, you know, expanding into other genre of testing. Whether people want to do performance testing, whether they want to do security testing and things like that, right? Uh, so that's the big vision for us as uh, quickly talking about a little bit about me uh, I think I'm still an engineer at heart. I think though the company, like Aksha mentioned, we have scaled to uh, roughly 750 folks. I think I still love to talk technology and spend time deep diving things, which I get a lot of feedback on. Like, well, please uh, let us do it. Uh, but I uh, said that I completely, uh, I think I love uh, taking up new challenges still. Uh, I get extremely excited about whenever product leadership comes up with, okay, we should, we need to add this and which I haven't seen before. And like, oh yeah, this is super exciting. Let's do this and we'll probably get it done in, yeah, sometime weeks, sometime months. And then when I go back to my team and talk about it, they're like, no, cool. Have you even thought of what this is about and what we need to do here? And I think David and Jamil probably talk about how, uh, how fun slash frustrating their journey been on my commitments. Uh, but uh, uh, said that that's been, I think, uh, uh, fun of, uh, I think being a part of such a business has been. Uh, uh, just to under, uh, I think the challenges uh, from, I think, uh, like I said, we started with eye testing, expanded into Safari, then automate product lines, moving to emulators first, moving from emulators to real devices, and then to other app product lines. I think each one of them had their own challenges. Each one of them led to, uh, uh, I think, new, uh, 
constraints and new uh, capabilities needs to be added, which we were weren't sure about how we're going to solve it. But uh, I think that's uh, the fun part has been. So uh, just quickly talking about challenges, right? Uh, while I'm expanding on this uh, journey. Uh, so I think it started with taming the IE browser, which was probably a challenge in itself. Uh, then came uh, about how do we uh, host? Uh, I think desktop, I didn't have any experience into. Uh, I was a pure application engineer, a little bit of uh, tinkering with AWS back in, uh, I think 2011, 12. So I think hosting uh, desktop was a huge challenge for me. Then moving to hosting real devices, uh, figuring out streaming. Uh, even in the first part, we had the streaming challenges because everyone wanted if I pay more, can you give me a faster experience, right? Uh, so I think streaming uh, was a core, is still a core part of our uh, technology stack and how do we make it better? Uh, moving to supporting local testing, like uh, most of the developers want to test what they're building locally on the remote infrastructure. How do we enable that? And then there is a lot of different configurations as you know, different people have different setups, different staging environments, different, uh, I think, uh, network configurations in their offices to make it work uh, remotely. Uh, and of course, I think the uh, real device cloud then providing this an app testing support. How do we, uh, you know, consume apps? How do we uh, support them? How do we enable the mobile features uh, for more and more testing? Someone wants to test, uh, you know, a fingerprint uh, on remotely and things like that. So that's uh, each one of these. And this is just a, I think, tip of the iceberg. I'm sure uh, David probably have a lot more to talk about later, but uh, each have been a very challenging problem. Uh, the so if you look at it the breadth of the problems you have to solve uh, and uh, i think most of these have not been done before no one else is facing this no one else is solving this so there's no documentation around it uh, so there's a lot of uh, for lack of a better word i suppose reverse engineering a lot of uh, head banging with the wall a lot of brainstorming with other peers uh, to solve problems i think most of the problems i ended up solving i probably do a long meeting with our guys, uh, with our team and figure out, okay, guys, we have tried this, what else we can try. And I think that's been a phenomenal journey to probably uh, brainstorm with so many smart people to solve such difficult problems. So uh, that's a little bit on the problems. Uh, the further on that, I think quite a lot of solutions tends to be have a lifetime of an year for us uh, because the landscape changes, we have to add new uh, platforms, we have to support new uh, I think changes from vendors uh, around their operating system, around browsers, around uh, device capabilities. We didn't uh, used to have, uh, I think, touch uh, on the phones earlier. Uh, sorry, we had touch phones. Now there is, uh, I think, face ID and stuff like that. So each year brings new set of challenges for us to support, uh, which makes it more fun. And it's not also it's not about building it once. Uh, I suppose given you this is a cloud infrastructure when people consume it uh, uh, in their locations whether it's remote at their homes and their offices i think everyone wants it faster everyone wants it more uh, uh, better which means every year we have to innovate okay streaming is 20 fps how do we make it 25 fps right uh, so all the constraints remain the same but getting to 20 fps was a tough enough challenge and making it 25 fps is not just about adding more locations i think it's about how do we uh, optimize on the software side and hardware so combination of both uh, a lot of uh, brainstorming uh, and problem solving goes there. Same for like, when you ask for a browser, how fast can I get it? I think when we started, we were at probably uh, four or five seconds. As we started adding more features, started expanding, it went to 10 seconds. And then we, again, the product comes back and say, we want it in one second. And you're like, oh yes, one second, we'll do it. Uh, this sounds fun. And it probably took us its own challenge to solve it. I don't think we are at one, we are at a few seconds still, but uh, I think that's been every year even though I have solved this problem in the past and I have some context and some experience in it, I think it's not been easy to uh, probably uh, uh, make it better. Uh, but that's been the fun as well. Uh, so some of the problems you could, I think most of the problems we couldn't solve by just redesigning stuff or re-architecting. I think most of the problems tends to be uh, pretty uh, intense and uh, specific to the technology we're working on and the breadth is huge. And uh, of course, I think, as most of the engineers here would know, I think product wants everything yesterday. And of course, customers want it uh, yesterday as well. So the pressure of timelines on the difficult unsolved problems helps a lot as well. Uh, so uh, I think that's a little bit what the, uh, I think, technology problems. Uh, talking about scale. Uh, so I think the framework remains the same, which comes down to solving three problems, uh, which is people, process, and systems. I think people has been uh, a little different for us uh, because of the breadth, the onboarding is very different. We had our own custom, uh, uh, I think, figure out ways to how do we make sure we can uh, 
we can inject uh, i think so much uh, bread into our uh, the new joinees uh, i don't think we have done a phenomenal job i think we've done a good job there uh, bespoke solutions makes it more complicated and the technology stacks makes it uh, i think difficult as well uh, second is i think doing problem solving at scale uh, despite because of the bread each team have their own challenges and each team have the challenges which haven't been done before so i have, even if we are expanding from 10 to 50 to i think 500 uh, i think the each team have their own challenges which you need to figure out even when the new guys getting so it's not you have high solve it once and the team is scaling it up it's about that piece is there but on top of it you also have to solve it again every year uh, like i explained earlier right so uh, i think that has been a, uh, a little bit on the people i think uh, process systems have been uh, relatively easier but i think just uh, i think keeping up with a uh, very problem and i think they would probably double click again on it uh, is about procurement uh, i think the procurement system though we have gone uh, maybe in a much better state but i think figuring out how do we get all these phones procured really good uh, in a good timelines and all the uh, i think stack across the globe i think has been a huge challenge which is specific to us and we need it on very strict timelines uh, so i think some of those uh, process issues i think systems wise uh, we are a data center so uh, like infrastructure company so a lot of data center principles applies to us given it's a bespoke solution so we had to build a lot of systems uh, i think specific to our own needs and uh, i think of course scaling them and building them has been uh, some challenges i think we learned a lot about uh, i think how do we i think every year we probably still figure out new problem which i didn't know even exist uh, i think so whether we are ability to monitor and raise alarms on so many different metrics so many different aspects of the whole engineering piece has been uh, i think overwhelming and every year still after 10 years i keep finding new metro which i didn't know about till we we should be monitoring and we didn't know about uh, so uh, i think that's a quick uh, sneak peek into uh, i think some of the challenges and uh, what excites me and uh, keeps me uh, waking up in the morning with three engineering problems uh, which i need to probably still solve uh, yeah, i think that's a little bit about uh, i think rather stack and our problems uh, so back to akshay to go into deep dive into some of those aspects Thanks, Nagul. Thanks for sharing this detailed experience, and uh, I'm sure, um, I, I guess, I totally relate to uh, the part where the the problems are, you know, uh, pretty challenging, and uh, it's been a you know great ride. Uh, I'll just quickly uh, introduce uh, the other panelists, and then we can kickstart with the conversation. I'll just give a quick introduction about myself. Uh, i work as an engineering manager with browstack and uh, why i am a part of this conversation is because uh, when i joined browstack around four and a half five years back i was part of the initial core mobile platform team and uh, we had just moved into a new data center so things were pretty fast paced and i'd been a part of a very exciting uh, part of the journey uh, then um, and uh, let's say um, more around what this session is going to cover uh, as nakul mentioned we are an infrastructure company and we provide the service of uh, you know uh, helping users test uh, their uh, uh, stuff on our platform uh, so we are pretty much into two parts one is handling the infrastructure where uh, uh, let's say we support in excess of 2000 different combinations of uh, mobile devices and desktop browsers and desktop machines and stuff like that and on the other hand uh, Uh, you know it's more of uh, the software challenges where we have to keep pace with the uh, product features and different kind of things as nakul mentioned that we have to ship all those things uh, in order to keep pace with the times so uh, given this uh, i would like to uh, you know introduce dimil uh, dimil is a director of engineering at browstack he's pretty much been the part of browstack family ever since i guess the co-founders had an idea of uh, starting up or the recruitment uh, part of the technical team He's been here since eight years, and uh, yeah, uh, Dimit, it'll be great if you can give us uh, an introduction and start the event. Sure, Akshay. Thanks, thanks, buddy, for uh, <laughs> answering that to me. I, I could, uh, I could relate. I, I didn't. I forgot that you had started in mobile. It was fun times. I think. Uh, do you miss mobile? You can probably porch as well right now. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the kind of problems that we solved over there, it was pretty intense. I, I, I it's. it's a totally different conversation mm. <laughs> sure man so uh, as as uh, so hey, hey guys i i hope you guys are keeping safe uh, just a disclaimer i am in mumbai my net might conk off so do let us know in chat if if you are not able to uh, hear bits of it 
I have been with Browstack. I recently completed eight years with Browstack. Uh, it's been a fun journey. Uh, out of which I would say, in in most of like in 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 either capacity, I've been part of mobile uh, for for roughly four five years now. So right from uh, starting of mobile to then uh, having a team, seeing them take mobile to I don't know a rocket ship uh, to right now, let's say guy uh, coming back to mobile. So yeah, I've been I've been part of it. Uh, with that, of course, I've when I started, uh, yeah, forget uh, there were single digit, of course, employees uh, with Browserstack, but also we just had uh, Automate as one product and uh, desktop platform. As as Nikhil said, right, it was we had no clue back then how to host desktop. Uh, I don't know why we thought about uh, even hosting mobile. Kidding, I don't know that, but uh, yeah, that's been a fun fun eight years of uh, my. Uh, Life. Uh, now, I, I would probably transfer it to David. I'll, I'll try to introduce uh, you to David. But uh, yeah, with David, I think it is fun to drink, especially in SF. Uh, yeah, you you would not have uh, got an Irish guy drunk. Uh, I think that's that's the only time I've seen David drunk. So yeah, it was a fun. David, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, yeah. Wow. What an intro. You have to bring that one up. Um, <laughs> hi everyone. I am. I'm. David Braden, I'm the Director of Data Center Operations. So um, I'm with BrowserStack just shy of five years. And um, I've been working in IT in Dublin now in Ireland for about 22 years. Um, and my core background was in the area of sort of build automation, CI, CD, um, infra automation, things like that. Um, and I guess my, my concentration in, in BrowserStack over, over the last few years has been mainly concentrating on building out and, and scaling and, and making our data centers <coughs> highly available and um, making them global. Um, so yeah, um, DeMille does try and, and, and stop um, stop me in that in, in my tracks with the, the whole high availability thing. Um, he does his best to take it down whenever he can. Um, but yeah, that's it. That, that's part of my role. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now that we are done with the introductions, let's move on to the juicier part of the conversation. Let's kickstart this conversation with a couple of questions so that you know the audience gets to know more about what's cooking uh, in uh, at BrowStack. So uh, the first question uh, I'd like to uh, ask David uh, is that uh, you know uh, people have this uh, sort of question uh, when they think about BrowStack. The BrowStack is a SaaS company. And uh, you know we offer our platform as a service. And uh, when you think about it, and you know the different kind of uh, scale that we operate on, uh, the first question that comes is how our infrastructure is placed, what scale are we operating on, and how does it look like in the organization? Uh, can you just uh, throw some yeah, light? Yeah, sure. On? So I guess um, like to support our, our the range of products that we have across live and automate, desktop and um, mobile. Um, we host a range of hardware from Windows, Mac OS, and of course, mobile devices, both Android and, and iOS. Um, I think currently we have somewhere in the region of about 25,000 devices, both phones and machines hosted um, globally. Um, and most of this is, is hosted in, in co-located data centers. So, um, and I guess in, in order to make sure that we can provide the, the best product possible, like we've spent the last four to five years trying to forge um, relationships with most of the, you know, the best best in class data center providers globally um, on pretty much all continents. I think at this stage where we have some some form of presence, um, we also make use of AWS and um, and GCP as well. And there we have things like um, HTTP and WebSocket servers, and also the the actual the core browser stack website is is hosted there as well. Makes so sense. A, 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 good, a good array of different tech. <laughs> totally. Uh, talking about the origins, uh, and since we are on the topic of mobile uh, mobile engineering, uh, Dimil, uh, why mobile? Uh, like, why did BrowStack have to venture uh, uh, into the mobile space? That too in 2014, 15, when the growth trajectory was good and people were testing heavily on, let's say, desktop browsers. Why did we have to make that decision, a risky decision? Uh, at that time, yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, now that I retrospectively think about it, right? Yeah, of course, that was a decision that was guided by uh, product, but uh, if I think about it, it was the right decision. Um, 
the only reason why i feel uh, desktop doesn't scale is of course the customers traffic customers were asking for it right? uh, if you see that market trends as well they were shifting towards uh, uh, more and more usage of uh, mobile devices rather than the traditional uh, desktop computers or uh, laptops right so people had already started the migration back then that means people would want to test on uh, uh, mobile devices of course we started we tried uh, our hands on emulators uh, emulators and simulators but mm, long story short they and then they are not uh, that great uh, to 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 start with and uh, yeah to to be honest it is just a natural progression right that gives us a a bedrock for probably giving out uh, more products over it right so uh, if we, if we just focused on desktop or desktop it would have been live and automated product but getting into a, a a new platform or a new infra uh, investing that into a new infra that just broadens our horizon to probably give more products and that's where to see the likes of uh, the app testing products that we have right so uh, venturing into mobile has its own challenges and one thing that i can think of is the scaling challenge so uh, david how about if you want to add something to this since you're directly locked in the bullseye of the you know customers demand and trying to increase uh and uh, this hosting services yeah yeah i guess like if if you look back to sort of like the the early noughties um when you know the only thing that really existed on mobile back then was sort of wap web pages which let's face it nobody ever did anything with it it never really took off i guess when when apple launched the the first iphone i think it was um 2007 um that kind of opened up the floodgates for um you know having proper like web browsers and proper web content on, on mobile devices and i guess that that started the whole shift towards towards mobile and then came various competitors with windows phone and um android and and everything else later and i guess like now we see situations where customers have an excess of maybe 60% of their overall traffic is is on mobile so i guess for us this was this was an easy decision to make from a business perspective because if our customers are developing for mobile then we need to move to support it so it was it, for us it was really a no brainer it was the next step makes sense but uh, emulators are also uh, i mean something that developers test on right they mean don't don't get me started on that <laughs> yeah i saw your expression when you earlier uh, mentioned emulators uh, but why so like why can't people just use that and why real devices have that kind of a difference or an edge So, so to start with generic way, right? It, it's not accurate, right? Because your emulator simulators would be, let's say, in case of Android, it's provided by Google, but that necessarily doesn't uh, give you the end user experience, right? When I say the end user experience, it doesn't have uh, the native uh, Chrome. It doesn't have the actual aspect ratio of an S20. It doesn't have the picture density. It doesn't have so many things, right? Which which a real mobile device could have, right? with also with that to add to it a generic issue is on stability and performance i remember uh, uh initially right in 14 15 or maybe in 13 14 as well right uh, an emulator you should take like 3 or 4 minutes just to boot right forget about launching your browser or launching forget about launching your application on it but just to boot it used to take uh, 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 that enough time right so it takes it on your performance stability is not there imagine you are at 90% of your test suits and suddenly the emulator crashes like you are in a nightmare of a situation where you have to restart right so those kind of issues were there uh, to top it up the way android and ios have evolved right that also has played a very key role so uh, to start off with android the biggest problem is fragmentation so i did say i did give an example of s20 but that's not the only example i mean uh, if I, all of us can at least name like 10 or 20 android devices that we know of right and I, i bet you all 10 or 20 will have different displays right uh, forget about displays but they will have different processors where your apps performance could differ forget about performance they might have different versions of uh, flavors of android where your app could behave differently right so the fragmentation is a huge problem in android i don't think every provider every oem provider would provide an emulator for that and if if even if they do to set it up and run uh, hit the ground running it it's very difficult to uh, do it in an emulator right uh similar problem in ios maybe fragmentation is not a big problem but the wall garden approach of uh, ios is right they restrict you they restrict you to what you can test right example is notifications you can't uh, test those kind of things on simulators you will need to have 
uh, real mobile devices to test on it right uh, there are certain use case of interruption testing that may or may not be possible directly on simulators you would need a real mobile device right so a combination of generic issues of the entire stability performance uh, and the annoyance of uh, setting up the emulators and simulators and of course the uh, addition of uh, os level approaches that both google and apple have taken that for an end customer i think it forces them if they want a very high level of confidence before shifting their uh, uh, websites and their application it forces them to actually uh, run on real mobile devices makes sense uh, but let's say in 2014 15 13 uh, you mentioned that you guys were uh, trying this thing out and we already have a q and a question around what the tech stack looks like let's rewind back and at that point of time when you were working with the first proof of concept how was the setup like uh, how was the technical challenges at that point of time yeah i i was much younger i had more hair i'm sure i could speak on david's behalf as well <laughs> uh, i think my cool called it out in the intro right it is it is solving those unknown problems i mean um, so to start with right it was a i come from i mean all of us generally come from a strong application development program uh, background right we know how to code and how to write uh, uh, a plus b equals to uh, c or rc equals to a plus b right it's it's that kind of a background that we come into uh, suddenly one fine day we started uh, uh, i remember having a discussion with nakul that hey, let's let's start uh, building real mobile devices and uh, these are the two devices that we have i remember it was uh, <coughs> samsung galaxy s2 um you could right now the computation power that it had apparently it was higher than the apollo 13 mission uh, but that device sucked sucked right it, it if you if you hold that device right now it it's pathetically slow and that that was my first uh, device to build and uh, to add to it i i think it was uh, iphone 5s or iphone 5 uh, some something around that that lines on ios um that was the first problem right that those devices were not mature enough to to probably have they were not rugged, rugged like they, they were not the current devices that you see that that last you for like uh, ages right i mean there was of course that nokia era that that had that 1100 which sorry 3300 that that was the phone that was unbreakable to uh, the current phones which are more fragile to add to it it was also a problem of fragmentation in terms of the testing tool i remember there were so many testing tools that were available right right now uh, sort of the market has been captured by uh, appium uh, so to say in in mobile devices of course there are xe ui expresso and many many other frameworks which which uh, play a significant amount of role but with that back then there was celendroid there was appium there was earl grey there was calapash i don't know there were there were so many frameworks right to just to finalize that framework and once you had that framework in play it was a different joke because uh, now suddenly you have a, a i i had a macbook uh, to to start with right to set up the first apm or a first android server on that macbook connect my uh, mobile device enable the adb or the command line utilities in ios that was a nightmare and uh, yeah i think akshay you have cursed me enough for this right we started with batch <laughs> as as the as the default uh, uh uh go to things to so my first server i remember it was an nc uh that server didn't uh, last for more than two days because it was single threaded and of course it, there was no way to multi process it so the first request if i can say that right it was localhost some 8080 port slash start.sh which generally just triggers uh, uh, a set of command on the mobile devices um of course then we have matured enough to realize at least i have matured enough to realize that maybe uh, uh, booting up a server in bash is not a good idea so now i now now we do have uh, uh, ruby where where we do uh, a very high level web service abstraction and uh, actually you have you have been part of it right so you have you've seen uh, ruby now okay. firing certain bash commands <laughs> <laughs> yeah we are rolling uh, the yeah, nose still <laughs> there the is a high level language <laughs> in play but uh, yeah it did this this made it, it made a logical sense right because there there are so many uh, things that a uh, high level programming language like ruby uh, provides out of the box where it's a simple json parsing man uh, i if i had to parse this in in bash i wouldn't have got uh, a remainder of my hair on my head right now <laughs> so yeah so it's, it's a combination currently it's a combination of ruby to ba- uh, ba- ruby and bash but of course we started with the strong uh, intention of just just doing it in bash <laughs> 
Right. And we have like two different platforms, iOS and Android. Uh, and you mentioned that there is so much, so much of fragmentation from a software perspective. Uh, how do we maintain that consistency uh, when we are hosting, uh, you know, these devices? So okay. for that, it was already, uh, so it was starting with the basics, right? Let's say, uh, even to maintain that consistency, we went into the foundation of what is needed. So let's say for me, when I was at least starting to write that code, right? Uh, the high level idea was, let's say, let's make that device available. Right? Now, what are the set of commands or set of uh, things that I need to do to make that device available? Very simply, it looks like huh, the battery has to be at a certain threshold. You need to uh, have that device, these many applications of browser stack to be installed. You need to have a particular Appium server running, right? So we started with that. Then we went how, what, what so started with listing down this command, then started with, uh, <coughs> sorry. Then we started with the, uh, compiling those commands together, right? When I say compiling those commands together, that means uh, how do I club it together and fire it as a single script? How do I write those healthy checks of, of writing those device out, right? And then finally, some fundamentals remain common across different platforms. So if, if I have to uh, say a device has to be, to, to, for, a, for a device to be healthy, it has to have a certain amount of uh, uh, connectivity or it has certain has to have certain, certain amount of battery uh, limit rate that remains common. But the way we do it in Android, we would have to use Android SDK versus way we do it in iOS, we would have to use the export utilities or the command line utilities that uh, uh, <coughs> iOS provides. So in terms of, let's say, the features that we are providing, it's not just, uh, you know, conventional servers that have been plugged in. So what are the kind of software challenges in terms of enabling these features? Or you can just give us a little bit of highlight in terms of what these features are uh, and what were the sort of challenges around them? Didn't you start on it? You should be the one probably <laughs> calling out here then. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? If I have to quickly skim through that, um, let's say... Uh, uh, let us streaming at 2025 FPS to our end customer, right? It's not a conventional thing where you have a desktop setup and you have to stream the desktop setup, right? It's, it's a mobile where the, it starts from capturing that screen to actually encoding that, then sending it to the client browser, uh, plus to add to it, capturing the JavaScript interactions on the client side to actually relaying them and playing it on re real time with uh, 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 real time on the mobile device, right? I just named one problem and within that one problem, that, that's one product problem, so to say. To just name that one product problem, there are so many sub-engineering problems, right from interaction to streaming to encoding on a low computation device, right? It's been, it's, it's been, um, yeah, it's, it's been a fun journey, right? And if I look at it as the security side of it, yeah, it, how, to, how to make sure that the device are healthy, how do we constantly re-engineer that uh, every year, where, wherever, a uh, new operating system gets released. We, we always have our hands on deck to keep an eye out for any any major operating level changes that happens on those devices. Yeah, I can totally relate on your, uh, you know, all those compliance and security bits and stuff because when I first joined in, I was thrown in the deep end. I was pretty much made on call on the first day of work by Nakul and uh, experienced all this stuff firsthand. <laughs> so... Yeah, you mentioned that, you know, you had this set up uh, on your local uh, machine and stuff, but when you want to standardize it as a process, when you want to host it on uh, in a DC, there are a lot of changes that need to be, uh, you know, uh, that are required to, uh, you know, be rolled out. So what do you think about them? Like, uh, uh, what was the hosting experience like? To start with, uh, it was pretty interesting. Right? Because the way we perceive, let's say, our applications uh, um, to be developed versus the way they get hosted, right? there is always a uh, always a difference. Right? Uh, most of us have Linux operating system, maybe not server grade, uh, to develop uh, develop our applications on. But when it gets deployed, it is a hardcore Linux server where your application generally gets deployed on. Right. Uh, so in this journey, I, I would say we experimented a lot. I would not only with the hardware where we want to host on, but also I think we've tried four or five operating systems how to, on, 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 on that regard. We have tried uh, uh, multiple set of hardwares where how do we see that mobile devices to be stable, right? Uh, right from, let's say, uh, because it was a multi-operating multi system environment, because of course we would fire commands on a particular host and that, that has to uh, do certain action on a mobile device. 
right? Uh, even even challenges in let's say uh, how do we host those uh, USB USBs, right? Uh, it, it's it's though it looks very simple, uh, it just kind of works out of the box. But we are talking at scale. I would rather uh, have uh, maybe maybe I'll probably uh, call in David here, right? It, it just uh, he has seen the hardware challenges more than me in in that aspect. Uh, to to yeah maybe David you can probably share some of it. Yeah sure I I guess um the best way to explain this would be for people to see it maybe from my perspective and how I saw it back a few years ago I mean um my first day on the on the job with Browser Stack was in a data center in Holland um, where I met Demille and Nicole um, for the first time since my interview and um, yeah. I was brought into the data center and it was here's here's the data center with where where we built our POC on our first product. Um, and, you know, pretty much told that, you know, this is, um, this is for you to take, improve scale. And, uh, by the way, um, no pressure. You need to move this whole setup to Dublin with no downtime. Um, and I mean, I, I've been in a data center once or twice before, and I think most people who haven't have a fair idea of what the inside of a DC looks like with you know, standard racks, PDUs, servers, storage units, um, the usual stuff that you would see, but browser stack is nothing like that. Um, the building is the same, but the, the inside is not. Sorry, you, you want to you say had something? The best, yeah, you had the best onboarding experience ever. Like I, I could say with validation, it was an international onboarding experience. <laughs> yes, <laughs> pulled out all the stops. Um, so yeah, just on that, like the, the fact that it it is absolutely nothing like um, like what you would see anywhere else. I mean, we've had numerous um, contractors that have come in into our space over the years, and the second the the door opens up, um, you just see their jaw hit the floor because they they what what's what's in front of them is nothing what they were expecting. And I guess like some of the the challenges that we would have had over the years is like what's the right operating system for for hosting this stuff on? Um, you know, like Demille was talking about ADB and. Um, you know the in, in, integrations with with the iOS platform, and then from that, what hardware do we use? Um, so we would have obviously we'd have to go through various iterations of of different hardware to find out which was more stable, especially at, when we wanted to be able to to scale this, um, and also from like a hardware and OS perspective, you also have to look at which is the best hardware to support the connectivity with the device. So all the, the devices have to be connected to the machine and to the OS, and how do you get stability around all of that? Then when we, we take it to the next level, then you're looking at these devices all need to be powered. Um, devices aren't designed, mobile phones aren't designed to be plugged in all the time and you know, charging 24 seven. And how, how do we manage all of that and the distribution of the power? Um, what was our core network going to look like? Because our core network now is very different to what our core network was back then. And, then we have the, the challenges around, you know, Wi-Fi. So I think we probably trialed every major Wi-Fi vendor out there. And yeah. because of it, I have crates and crates of wireless access points that are one. tried, tested, and discarded to one side. Um, one but, good thing that came out of that is my home Wi-Fi. Uh, at least my, I can say with validation, my home Wi-Fi is good, though the backbone might not be good. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I have... Uh, I have a mesh system running here at home, but let's just say like, I, I can't afford the system the browser stack runs, so I don't have the same one. <laughs> um, but what, what we have is effectively a state-of-the-art Wi-Fi system whereby we're able to host in excess of about two and a half thousand devices in 400 square feet, which is, if you can imagine, you know, the size of a, of a large room or like a, a small apartment or something like that. And we have two and a half thousand phones all in there simultaneously on Wi-Fi all at the same time. Um, that's a hell of a challenge and something that I wasn't expecting going through the door to be dealing with that sort of thing. That was your onboarding experience. That was fantastic mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, I guess that's the you best. Probably have, uh, <laughs> yeah. You could probably have all the participants here connected to a single Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> easily. So, uh, David, you mentioned about this, and what were some of the other challenges when you were setting up this data center, the next data center that your task was, but keeping in mind that this whole solution has to be repeatable and scalable very easily? Like, what were a couple of things off your head that makes this whole process very standard? Yeah, I, I guess if you think about some of the, the fundamental features that, um, that a data center offer, it's like power, cooling, connectivity, 
and none of our stuff fitted with that. I mean, um, you look from a like a power perspective, nothing nothing that was there had dual power source, for example. So you know, how how do you make it so that you have you have proper HA when it comes to to power? Um, from a cooling perspective, <coughs> we host things on all of our devices on custom built racks, um, but phones don't have fans. So you can't have the whole concept of hot and cold oil containment. So how do we make sure that when, you know, customers are absolutely hammering devices with tests and those devices are warming up, how do we ensure that they get cooled efficiently? Um, these, these were all some of, some of the challenges. Um, like I mentioned before, about the, you know, some of the, the connectivity issues that we had around like sort of the, the Wi-Fi density. Um, you know, how, how do we get to a point where we can scale our data centers to have that number of devices in that amount of space um, to make it cost effective to do what we do. Um, and that, that took a lot of trial and error, um, you know, but from a config software perspective, device config perspective, we, we brought in various different experts to help us with it. Then we ended up doing more tweaking of our own on top of it. And now we've kind of settled on, on a recipe that, that works for us. And because of that, it's become a, a global blueprint for our data centers. So. Um, like I was mentioning sort of, I started the company just shy of five years ago. We had one small data center um, in Holland that, that we moved to Dublin. Um, we now have nine, soon to be 10, I think, um, in around that sort of um, based on capacities of data centers globally for from a mobile perspective, but every single one of them is the same. And we, we do it like that because we know what works. Um, we just take it and I guess it's called the, the cookie cutter cutter approach. And I guess with this, something to mention as well is the, I think like any, any new, new continent that I went to or a new city that I went to to look for a new DC, I think some of the data center, especially some of the salespeople thought that I was crazy asking them to put devices with lithium batteries into their data center. They were like, no, no, stay away. They were getting the holy water out. And, you know, um, trying to convince data centers to allow us to do this and what we've done over, over the last few years is managed to partner with, with some really good DCs. And they now see that what we're doing is really the, the next step in, in the way the internet is going. And that, you know, if, if they're not, not on board with this, they're going, they're going to necessarily, they, they might miss something. Um, so we've managed to, um, like I said, forge partnerships with some of these. And it's, it's really working in our favor because they're starting to understand how we do things. They're starting to assist us with being able to scale our, our data centers better. And they're even coming back and giving us some feedback and um, some ideas on, on the way that we can do things with interconnectivity and, and things like that as well, which is which is great. Makes sense. Yeah, that sounds like a big challenge. And now that you know, we know that the data centers have been set up, moving on to the next part, from a customer's perspective, from a user's perspective, who's running uh, a test, how does, you know, their session map onto this device? How do, how does the allocation take place? How does the session start? Can you throw some light uh, on it, David? Yeah, I guess that that's all down to, um, I guess, different factors. So one would be what device the customer was asking for, what OS they, they want to test on. Um, then where is the customer located? So we always try to serve um, the session from the, the data center that's, that's closest to the customer. From a latency perspective, we want to give the best experience possible. If there isn't a device available, so if you're, if you're in Dublin and you're trying to access one of our Dublin data centers and we don't have any capacity available because it's super busy or the, I don't know, there's a problem, you will go to um, our next nearest European DC or, or over to the US East Coast or, or whatever the, the next um, data center is and you'll just keep falling back um, but I guess that's the, the beauty of a device cloud is that um, you have all these availability zones and everything just falls back to the, the nearest um, location. Um, and I guess that's why we put such a huge investment um, over the last sort of, I guess more so in the last two years um, in yeah. expanding our data center footprint um, hugely. Uh, like I, I was run all over the globe um, the year before COVID. I think we built out four or five DCs in, in a 12 month period. Um, <laughs> And I was racking up air miles left, right, and center. But um, but we did it. We got it there. And it means that we can now offer a, a far better product and a better a better experience to, to our customers. 
I think I think your yours is the only team that covers from Sydney to West Coast, US West Coast. Yes, yes. I do be <laughs> sometimes on, on on calls early in the morning and sometimes um, be on calls midnight, one a.m. It really depends. I manage a, a team from Sydney to California. Yeah, follow the sun. <laughs> so moving on to the next question, which uh, you know seems like a logical next. Now that you know we have allocated a session to a user. Uh, how do we make sure that this particular uh, you know thing that this customer is testing on the de this device stays as is you know uh, when they, since we are reusing the infrastructure there's somebody else who's going to come in uh, if they are going to use this architecture how do you make sure that uh, you know things keep rolling on uh, dimit do you want to take that on so that is uh, yeah i mean i can sorry so i was just saying that that is that is from comes from a mentality of uh, not sharing data from session to session right so that is where we uh, every time a user puts a particular device right be it in any of our products uh, we generally end up making sure that we are we delete that data so there is a state there is a cleaning state uh, after every device being used that's that's where we make sure that uh, all the data uh, <coughs> sorry excuse me <laughs> is being uh, crossed off right and uh, whenever the next user comes in the previous users uh, sessions are generally uh, the, the data is generally not present on the device uh, and of course, that's that's where the toughest problem comes into play because the fragmentation of uh, platforms and their uh, and the differences in the operating system and the OEM there 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 will there will be some tweaks of changes. So we make sure that we are near factory reset when when we uh, when when a user leaves uh, a particular device. Right, and of course there there could be some manual so it, and there could be some state where where we may not be. Uh, able to control it. That's, that's where I think we take um, help from David and Co to probably help us identify what is the problem of of uh, with that particular device. Yeah, I guess it's it's one thing that we we always try to pride ourselves in is that we would never ever serve a dirty device as we might call it to a customer. So if it if it fails any of the the cleanup procedure, we have checks to make sure that that device gets gets taken out of the queue and out of rotation and assigned for a engineer to pick up the device and manually intervene. So that could be that the device might need reflashing or, or, or um, manually wiping and uh, things like that. But it's, they're generally um, not, not, not so frequent, I guess, from a dirty device perspective. But, um, I guess just, just to add there as well, I mean, the, the DC engineers as well as, you know, being the, the safety net for that sort of thing for us as well, they look after the general and device health. So um we we do sometimes get th get situations where you might have customers who are you know running really intense apps and stuff on the devices and in that that situation if they're running a really long test they might deplete the battery faster than we can charge it um so sometimes they have to be taken out and, and manually charged and um you know and we we constantly keep an eye on you know daily metrics and you know the availability of devices and to make sure that that we have um, sufficient capacity in, in all of our different regions um, to serve customers' needs. Um, so, uh, yeah. Well, it makes sense. And from an engineering perspective, I can second that, you know, most of the problems that we face, uh, I guess whenever we do a root cause analysis or whenever, whenever we do a retrospective, it's the first thing that comes into mind is we don't want to do this again. So we try to automate most of the things, even though there's a big chunk of things which, uh, you know, are a couple of manual things which uh, data center operations need to do, uh, as David mentioned. So yeah, I, I uh, guess I, I guess one of the, the downsides of automation that Demil will attest to is automation is great for for pushing configs on on mass very very fast to lots of lots of machines. But there have been a few times where we've had um, bad configs pushed to hundreds of machines um, in in split second and and wiped out lots of data center capacity and then they. Yeah. The DC, thanks, the DC engineering you. team have to have to step in and clean up Demil's mess. Uh, that's now why the you... DC engineers wear wear the cape and save yes. us. <laughs> yes. Now this brings us to the next question, where you mentioned it wiped out a couple of capacity numbers. How do you handle scale and uptime? <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, how do we make sure that these uh, numbers are in place? And uh, can you share a couple of details around? Yeah. This? So I guess. Um, like we we have um, from a capacity perspective, we have daily reports that we get with regards to customer sessions, usage on devices, things like that, where the devices are located, 
And we always try to make sure that the devices are where the customers need them to be. So it's, um, and it's something that we, we actually have an internal group that, that work on this and we meet every, every couple of days. And, you know, do we need to buy more devices? Do we need to upgrade certain devices? Do we need to physically move devices? We, we try not to do that if, if we can, if we can. Um, and that that can be it can be challenging, especially um, I guess given the challenges that I mean it was always there with, with Apple in that you can't downgrade a device, you can only upgrade a device. And then with with um, Android, with vanilla Android, you can downgrade and upgrade. But with Samsung, you can upgrade, and you used to be able to downgrade. I think up until like the Samsung S7 or S8, then they they stopped that. So it means that we have to get it spot on all the time, um, or at least try to. And we need to project into the future. We need to, I need to know if I'm buying iPhone 12s now, I really need to know what we need 12 months from now or 18 months from now and, and trying to work out customer patterns based on previous years, previous releases. So we, we get, um, you know, we get to a point where I pretty much know exactly every, when, when every mobile phone is going to be released and when the different OS releases are going to be and stuff like that. And we have to have our finger on the pulse all the time. Uh, which is which is very very challenging and from a i guess from a procurement perspective um yeah i mean like we my team buy all the devices and ship them globally and that has never been more challenging than it has during covid um uh, we've we've managed to you know get a good relationship with some of the um the manufacturers and vendors and that's that's worked um in our in our favor where sometimes we get devices before they're released um, which means that we can get them delivered, get them um, on the platform and, and have them ready. Um, other manufacturers aren't, aren't so forthcoming with, uh, with, with that sort of arrangement. So um, then we, we have to scramble as soon as it's released to try and buy up as, as many as we can. Um, also, like one of the things that I guess to highlight here, like if we were to take, for example, a device that might be popular in Asia, um, but we might have a large IT customer, maybe based IT company based in the US, um, they want to test on an Oppo or a Vivo or something like that because they have customers in Asia. Um, but we're gonna have to provide those devices in the closest data center to that customer as well. So now it means that we have to take these Asian devices that maybe you cannot buy in the US or you can't buy in Europe and we now need to ship them globally. Um, so it, it, it has its challenges and um, that's when, as well, we get into the one of the things I didn't realize until I went to move the, the data center from Holland to Dublin is the, the Dangerous Goods Act and the fact that uh, it's very, very difficult mm. to ship devices with lithium batteries. Uh, you, so that, that was. Did you get yourself? No, no. <laughs> no, thanks. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, we've managed to find ways around that and, and find ways that allow us to be able to, to ship this stuff dealing with like specialist companies and, and things like that. So. Um, yeah, challenging. Yeah, all, all of this, like from a software as well as hardware and infrastructure perspective, seems like a really difficult challenge, not just to, uh, you know, set up by the, uh, by normal people, by normal engineers. So what Dimil uh, and David, I'll ask you separately. Uh, first, Dimil, uh, what are the different kind of tech skills and uh, uh, that are required to pull this job off? Since, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're directly involved with the whole... Uh, you know, hiring perspective, and we have a specific, uh, you know, set of problems that need to be solved. What is your take on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, so, uh, especially for mobile, right, or our platform like similar to mobile, right, we need people with uh, high debugging skills. <laughs> and I say debugging because it is about uh, reverse engineering those platforms at the end of the day, and figuring out what are the right ways to, uh, who can, uh, to give a seamless experience to the customer. Uh, that's where, uh, a spike in that kind of a domain health. With that, of course, you need to be nerdy and curious about uh, about tech of how how those platforms are functioning. Right at the end of the day, uh, uh, though they are mobile operating system, they are they are much much walled garden as compared to others. But they started as uh, uh, the the foundational Unix Linux systems, right? For for both the companies. So uh, how does how knowing how does those operating system works? Knowing how does applications? How does vendor OEM provide? Uh, enables uh, us to use those applications. That is something that we are looking for, right? With that, of course, uh, uh, there, there needs to be some decent exposure to programming, right? Of course, you need to have uh, idea of, uh, you, need, you need to understand uh, code, if I have to put it in that, that particular way, right? Because we, 
maybe uh, using ruby and uh, bash extensively but uh, in at times we are we, we do venture out into uh, pythons or uh, python related tools right so that keeps us slightly agnostic of of uh, technology we are not really uh, uh, of course we, we try to stick to uh, our forte but that doesn't mean that we we uh, go behind our curve right so we are looking for these skills i i i read so uh, i say had a sneak peek into a couple of q and a's right if you folks think that uh, you are the one hit us up man we are we are more than happy to hire more uh, rockstar engineers in mobile at this point uh, how does the team look like uh, in terms of size and right from like when you started versus now and i started when you started when one. <laughs> let's move on to let's say the first data center yeah yeah we we, we had like uh, the first poc that we did right and which was which david has talked about in netherlands uh, where we had successfully running uh, uh, of course a small setup of a small set successful running setup uh, we had right uh, three engineers back then uh, then we started adding more folks and right now uh, holistically as recent as last monday we had folks joining in so we are roughly at a strength of uh, 1920 people across uh, between uh, dublin and mumbai i mean right now people could be everywhere but that's that's where we have geographically hired them at it's so roughly uh, 20 or 30 people and david what about teams. you uh, yeah, can you throw some light on how the data center team is uh, logistically handled and how many yeah i guess uh, if, if let's go back in time i mean back when demil was talking about there was just one um, i think it was it was me i was moving running procuring doing everything um uh, like we are now i think at about 11 um on the the dc operations team and and that's expanding i mean we have we have more headcount um for this year we're hiring more engineers as we grow capacity we hire more as we expand into new regions we hire more um we're also starting to look at hiring software engineers for our team as well to assist with um uh, monitoring metrics automation all that sort of stuff um so um actually just to to add to what what demil was saying about the the mobile team i guess the the whole infrastructure automation aspect of what what these guys do these guys do is i guess what my bread and butter was for about 10 or 15 years and i i would have given my left arm to work on some of this stuff 5 6 years ago um and i would really like i i've tried to explain this to to people in the past as as a software engineer for like i was a software engineer for about 18 years if there was something that you couldn't do you can generally google it uh you know if if i was writing some automation around vmware or something to do with linux or mac os or something like that you'll always find either the answer or something that will get you there on google with what we do in browser stack that doesn't exist so it's it's really or and d um is is the the first part of it um and it's a lot of trial and error and um a lot of banging heads together and um trying to get stuff to work which which is what makes it really really interesting because it's it's we're doing Akshay something would relate to it. yes absolutely i should relate to it he came he came up with some uh proper software engineering background and we just told him that hey dude, this is mobile devices uh, this is your day one please make it work i think that was a directive that he got <laughs> yeah it yeah. was pretty scary as well as exciting uh, the kind of stuff that we did you can't find any kind of answers uh, i guess the first task that i had was to release firefox on all devices and nakul mentioned that we have a partnership and the deadline is let's say 5 days from now and that was my first task Wasn't you know, it today was- Wasn't it today? Sorry, wait. I am. Um, I take. I'll talk to Nakul separately about it. It has to be today. <laughs> so, uh, guys, there's a poll that might be flashing on your screen. Uh, if you are interested, uh, that just helps us uh, to know the intent of the folks that are on the call. It would be great if you can take the poll. Uh, moving on to the last question uh, before which uh, before that uh, before uh, our Q and A session. uh the last question is pretty much uh, setting the tone uh, of the whole uh, session you know where we are heading uh, what's the next in mobile engineering what's cooking in the lab some exciting features some exciting engineering challenges david uh, do you want to uh, take on that yeah i guess like i mean our our target is always to become like best in class with global presence that's that's where where we are now and like we we want to become the testing infrastructure of the internet i mean that's that goes what i'm saying i mean we want to be the product that everyone thinks of when they think i i've just written a web page or i've developed an app and i need to test that it works and they we want them to think of of browser stack as as the brand and i guess 
that that sort of thing like would be down to our marketing and sales team and all the rest. But what we need to do as engineering is make sure that we can cash the checks that they're writing. And from an infrastructure perspective, um, like DeMille and the mobile team and the the core guys and on all the other teams that we have that that feed into this whole product um, ecosystem have to make sure that it can scale. And me and my team have to make sure that the that the infrastructure um, can scale. And that's what we've been working to, um, I guess, for the last few years is to get it to a point where we can we can scale this. We can build the data centers. We can build them pretty fast. Uh, we can respond to new markets reasonably quickly. Um, and I, I think I'm I'm happy enough that we're we're kind of at that situation now where if if I was asked to to build a new data center in a new city that we can do it um, in a fairly short space of time, and and that it will it will operate the exact same as every as every other DC. And um, I guess we we've put a huge investment in. Um, over the last few years to reinforce the, the foundations of what's been laid over the last few years. And I guess that's going to lead us on to, I guess, Browser Stack 2.0 and, and the, the blitzscaling journey that we're on. And, um, and that's, that's really what it's all, all about. From, from my perspective, it's, it's the, the infrastructure, the scaling, and, and customer comes first. So um, as the guys will, know, will always know with me that the customer always comes first, <laughs> engineers come second. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, thanks, Demil. Uh, I, again, I'd like to I, I reiterate, if you guys want to post any questions for us to answer, we still have around 15 uh, to 20, uh, we have around 20 minutes or so. Uh, I'll just keep on the slide for another 30 seconds. You can post your Q&As over here uh, on the Zoom user interface, and we'll be taking up those questions. And while the questions are pouring in, maybe I'll probably uh, add to what David said. Right? Is, uh, it's an exciting journey of the next uh, set of things that we are doing, not only in terms of, let's say, of course, scaling is the largest problem that we are solving right now, but we are also, let's say, cooking up uh, new platforms. We are trying to solve uh, the mobile problem for uh, more vendors, right? We are trying to increase our uh, market share by not only just giving real mobile devices. I will just leave it at that, mic drop. <laughs> uh but yeah it is it is going to be a fun journey so yeah, i am really excited the team that i have and the plan that we have yeah all excited uh <laughs> i'll move on to the q a part we have a good bunch of questions uh we'll try to answer most of them uh the first question is uh having established itself as a leader in cross browser testing space uh, which is the immediate next area that BrowStack is looking to enter and expand? Uh, example, security testing, performance testing, test management space, etc. cetera. Uh, Demon, oh. do you want to take this? So I can take this. It's okay. So let's say from, from a perspective of the focus area, right? Every year, uh, every year we have been focusing, of course, on polishing our end and, and making sure that our products grow. But with that, also making sure that our uh, infra experimentation uh, continues, right? So we are surely uh, <clears throat> expanding into new platforms, right? As I, like I said, it is not only Android and iOS that we want to stick to or the same form factor that we want to stick to. We want to expand on that that particular area, give it a shot if, if, uh, if, if things go right. But with that also, let's say every product will have their own respective target areas. So we are getting into, I, I know for, I can probably speak on behalf of other folks, right? We are trying to uh, leverage automate at scale. So that is one of the focus that uh, we want to get to. Uh, live, App Live already have their own focus area of making sure that, that their product works for everyone. That means increasing their market share. Uh, that means giving out, let's say, more uh, device operating systems. And of course, a better seamless experience because all of these platforms will have their own challenges, right? And of course, expanding the fifth product or the youngest product that is there in the browser -like umbrella into uh, more fragmentation, per se, right? So of course, uh, Akshay, maybe you can talk more on that, but of course we have it in, uh, we have added one or two browsers. Uh, we intend to add uh, a complete suite of browsers in Percy pretty soon, right? So Demel, I think it might be worth mentioning for anyone that doesn't know what, what Percy actually does. Um... Akshay, why don't you take that? A quick TLDR. 
Yeah. So basically, Browse Tag aims at uh, you know becoming the testing infrastructure on the internet, and the immediate Im uh, adjacent space was uh, in terms of visual testing or figuring out visual divs. So Percy as a product helps uh, people figure out uh, in their uh, uh, in their applications and in their websites in their uh, components. Uh, uh, if there is any kind of differences in what is being shipped and uh, whether that can be, uh, you know, immediately called out. I guess we can move on to the next question. Uh, and I guess uh, this is probably directed at Nakul uh, because uh, that's what he talked about in the beginning. Uh, Nakul, it'll be great if you can come back uh, on the panelist. Yeah. Uh, so it's a little it's complicated and long. <laughs> yeah, uh, so... Yeah, I'll just go ahead with the question. Uh, the question is that Nakul, you talked about latency. Uh, please share an overview of how you guys uh, achieve network acceleration and high availability with uh, mobile devices. Uh, I assume HA proxy doesn't work when it comes to mobile devices. And uh, how did you uh, how do you achieve a lot of FPS? You want to route requests specific to a network and not public internet. And uh, how did you guys achieve load balancing between devices? I guess it's a pretty long one, but it mainly means key. how are we routing requests and making sure that the network is good enough. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I think we have iterated it over the years. I think the first one started like, uh, I think like the million David mentioned, right? We have only one data center. Uh, uh, and at that point, we iterated it through streaming solution a lot. How do we make that technology better? How do we uh, make, don't use, enough CPU that the user app or website gets hurt, but use enough that we can provide a good experience. Uh, finding the sweet balance was a problem and it took some amount of time. We did try some of the, uh, from point to point perspective, just the, I think the uh, user to the, uh, I think DC or the device. It can see edited through solutions, enterprise uh, as well as in commercial, as well as I think open source tools to probably see how we can probably do a better job there. And of course, I think, uh, the last, not the least, uh, like David mentioned, right? Being ability to uh, get it closer to the device, getting devices closer to the customer, that has probably been the, uh, I think, uh, the biggest win. But uh, yeah, I think these are the three ways probably we have tried and uh, we use almost all three of them today. Did I miss anything, guys? No, I guess no, okay, good. No, pretty good. much yeah. uh, One other question. Uh, Demil, since you had mentioned fragmentation a couple of times, I'll probably direct this to you. You can probably route it to someone else. As uh, you mentioned, the question is, as Demil mentioned, fragmentation is one of the most important challenges. Uh, and with the rise and option of open source alternatives for mobile devices, what are browser stacks plan to accommodate open source mobile OS, considering they're one of the biggest advocates of open source development? So uh, this is more or less of a tech tech problem and more of a product thing. So let's say if, if we were to, uh, okay, we have to take that question around, right? Why does Rastag give uh, uh, Android and iOS? That basic idea behind giving that Android and iOS is to uh, make sure uh, our users get at most confident or confidence when they ship their websites and application, right? So if there is a third alternative or they, if they, there are any other alternatives, right? Uh, in open source, even otherwise, right? That, that grows up the ladder of, of capturing that market share which forces our end customers to actually test on uh, those operating system, we would have to do it. I won't say, we, I, I don't know if uh, anyone else uh, feels otherwise, but we would have to uh, do it because that's that's the vision that we want to meet, right? That's that's the direction that we want to head in. Yeah, yeah I guess since... all, all, of our, all of our product and capacity and everything is, it all comes from uh, market research and what, what the end user is using, what our customers want to test on and, um, we're not really going to just, you know, add add a device that that nobody's using, and um, so we need to make sure that it's it's a device that has good uptake and that customers actually want to develop and test on it. And just to take on that open source bit, uh, we support open source, right? Uh, by maybe uh, if there are any tools that are there which which are uh, already open source and they need uh, uh, let's say testing. Definitely, we have uh, some scheme where, where you can definitely get in touch with us and uh, that could be procured, but it's less about the open source operating system, but it's more about supporting that community in general. Makes sense. Uh, coming out over to the next question, uh, David, uh, this is directed to you. Uh, does BrowStack have a private cloud offering for each customer? Uh, can you take over that? <laughs> 
um does it um i i guess it's it is something that um we we've, we've been looking at for for a long time and it's um i guess it's something that we can offer potentially um it really depends on um the right customers coming along and, and, and wanting such a thing it's it's not um something that we really go proactively trying to trying to sell to anybody at the moment um but we're we, we wouldn't we don't say no necessarily on <laughs> Makes sense. But most most of our users use this uh, uh, offering that's there in the data center, and we maintain yeah. the pristine devices. So yeah. it's pretty yeah, much. Yeah, because it, it would be uh, it's, it's a lot more cost effective that way, I guess. From not from our, necessarily from our perspective, but from a customer perspective as well. Sorry, Nicole. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, just to add to David, I think also uh, because I think how we have been smoothly able to scale the I think our public cloud. We see a lot more value for customers if they probably stick to public cloud because we are already promising all the security and the uh, I think pristine devices. Plus, you get the scale benefit, which a dedicated uh, solution. You have their own challenges of uh, dedicated devices and scaling up and down. We're always uh, it's like using your own data center versus using AWS. Right? That's the benefit you get using our side. So that's one reason we probably look at uh, not pushing in that direction uh, because essentially customers won't uh, get the most benefit out of our side as a product. Right. Nakul, uh, one more question for you. Uh, uh, it's mainly around, uh, you know, why uh, some differences between emulators and real mobile devices. Uh, the question is, why can't we have a hybrid setup of emulators and real devices? Uh, some specific tasks can run on emulators and other tasks on real devices. This is coming from uh, somebody who's mentioned key, uh, it, it's going to reduce prices for them sure. like they're probably looking at a hybrid plan i'm not sure but yeah can you take on that question <laughs> sure uh, so uh, uh, that's a great question and it's not like we haven't pondered upon it uh, i think over the years uh, but the reason we stick to uh, real devices i think because we want to make sure once you browse text says this works it works for their customers right we have come across cases where it worked on emulators and it didn't work on for their end customers and of course uh, the second reason which Jamil mentioned earlier is i think the stability and performance uh, when it doesn't work, you, it, it leads to a huge confusion. Is it a browse stack issue or is it a platform issue or is it a device issue, which you don't want to probably get into by providing a real device, which works, which has the real power to do probably everything what the customer is looking for. We are able to provide a great experience and a, a much stable builds. So we did have emulators right earlier. And then there are all constant challenges on how do we make it faster? How do we make it stable? My build is failing and stuff like that. So just to not get into any of those challenges, we probably still don't uh, support emulators just to make sure we provide amazing experience for our customers. It's not about cost at all. Got it, makes sense. And as uh, I guess whoever asked this question, uh, Timil countered the question uh, of why emulators versus real devices. And uh, you know he threw light on why emulators are not state of the art, uh, the different kind of discussions and why uh, actually our customers who have uh, so many users of mobile devices would be so distant from the real experience when they are testing on emulators. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, I guess I'll probably direct this to uh, uh, Demil. How does BrowStack deals with security? Uh, I am from cybersecurity field. That's the question. I, I may not be the proper subject matter expert for this, but uh, uh, okay, on a very nice way, we do what uh, other companies do, right? There is no uh, range of range. We definitely have uh, uh, compliances and security certificates that are there. So anything that needs to be done as part of those certificates, uh, we, we try to harden our fences on that, right? Uh, having said that, let's say we do have a process of, uh, it, okay, the certificate is of course not uh, given by browser stack to browser stack, right? We do have external audits that, that uh, occur every uh, few months, right? Or maybe uh, uh, every semester where we look at uh, what are the different audit trails? How do we, uh, how, how are our processes and systems in place in terms of the security aspect? And we make sure that uh, they are they are there in regards to the industry standards. I think it's, it's worth saying from a security perspective as well. Like when you look at the, the the mobile data center aspect of it, they're kind of really dumb terminals. We don't really store any, all the customer information isn't stored on site in the DCs. So 
it it makes the data centers um, less of less of a target and um, less of a, a liability for us, I guess, in that it's just really full of phones and machines that are orchestrating the infrastructure. Makes sense. Uh, the next question, uh, I guess anybody can take it up. Uh, it's again around latency. Uh, in addition to what uh, I guess Nakul mentioned, this question is about uh, how do you deal with latency when you're interacting with app and website? So this is more around uh, you know handling interactions and making them more real time and responsive. Uh, um, uh, David, I, can, please, yeah. I might be able to, if I understand it correctly, I guess it's um, when a customer is testing on our device, how do we ensure that they're getting a, a good experience from the device to their to their own website where they're doing the testing? Um, I guess the, the fact that we, we have our, our data centers spaced globally, um, the fact that we partner with some of the best data centers um, around, we also have invested a lot of money in, in our networks, in our, our uplinks, our bandwidth, everything else. And, um, and also, I, like I touched earlier on, on the, the amount of work that we put into our, our Wi-Fi systems. Um, and one of the reasons that, that we, we use the Wi-Fi systems mainly is to simulate how a customer will be using the phone. So, um, so we, we want to make sure that, that we, can, we can keep doing that. And um, it, it's really down to the the infrastructure that we use, the investment that we put into making sure that we're in top tier DCs is the is the key to this, I think. I guess the next question is very interesting and it's related to uh, you know, hosting, uh, but uh, it's over to you, David, uh, as to how much details you want to provide on this. How securely are the devices kept to avoid a possible peaking from DC personnel while a testing session is on? Asking from a privacy point of view. <laughs> yeah, okay. So. Um, all of our, like I said, all of our data centers are, are the same. Um, we have a cage space, um, or in some DCs, we actually have physical rooms and the cages are completely blanked. Nobody can see in. We have biometric security, motion sensitive cameras, and we actually have an agreement with the DCs that no data center staff are allowed to actually enter our cage unless they're accompanied by a browser stack member staff. So we actually get alerts and stuff if, if somebody goes into the space without one of us accompanying them. So, um, and that's, that's always been like that since from the, the day that that I, I took it over. That was Nicole's main requirement is uh, keep it secure, protect IP and protect the customers um, sessions and stuff. So it's you just you literally can cannot see what goes on behind those four walls. So there's I think there's, a lot of the DCs are huge and like hundreds of people walking past the door every day and they've no idea what's the other, what's behind that door. So it's yeah. And the topic of right, even if uh, for, for the people that walk in, right, including let's say if uh, David or uh, I walk into that DC, uh, the data of what test is running on what device is completely obfuscated from us. So we generally don't know of uh, what is an active session and uh, which device is running that active session on. Uh, so we just have to keep an eye out on uh, our due diligence maintenance rather than uh, looking at any sessions. And whenever we want to take anything out, generally they end up blocking those setups first and then enter to do any maintenance uh, on, on those uh, setups. Yeah, and actually, I think if um, if you won't plug the devices, they go into a, a self-reboot and everything anyway, so it, it kills whatever is going on on the devices. So um, it's, it's well covered. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, I'll move on to the last question now. Uh, I guess I'll redirect it to Nakul uh, since he's been at the helm of making these decisions around the technical stacks and designs and architecture. The question is, what tech stack does Browse Tech use? Reasons for this choice of tech stack and the design and architecture? I guess it's a pretty broad question. You can probably narrow it down and minus the architecture. I, Thanks. I, no, I, I am not interested anymore. to know. <laughs> I am interested to know this answer to this question. So Akshay, you said uh, who's making those decisions. I think not anymore for a few years. You guys don't like me despite how much I want to, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, said that, I think we uh, started as a pure Ruby shop. Uh, most of our code, I, me and Ritesh wrote in the first version was Ruby because we were Ruby fanboys. Uh, I think as we started building more components and uh, tech, uh, we expanded into other platforms and product lines, I think uh, technology kept changing because of the people came in, they wanted to try something new. So we tinkered with Node.js, we tinkered with Go, we tinkered with uh, uh, we didn't do Java because Dimil loves Java, and I was like, sure, we are not going to use Java. <laughs> uh, just someday, to, uh, someday. 
<laughs> just to have fun with him. Uh, but uh, so that's on the technology stack, uh, and we use a lot of other like we heavily rely on uh, shell scripting uh, still, uh, and a lot of it we have migrated to uh, I think better languages as well. But still, Python and bits and pieces and stuff like that. Now uh, back to I think uh, architecture and design. I uh, I don't know if this is the answer. I think some of the basic principles we always follow, like uh, I think uh, try to have as loosely uh, connected components as possible. Keep uh, as most of the business logic in one place, uh, so that you know everyone uh, is not trying to implement half here, half there. So most of the terminals do stuff what they are supposed to. They don't have any application business logic. All application business logic is in one place. The other components on for uh, you know uh, what do you call it? Uh, we call it terminals, which all the uh, device and infrastructure management and things like that. So I won't say we are big microservices fan, but I think as much uh, unique components possible. But we don't overdo it at all. Yeah. It's about solving the problem in the right way, right? If, if uh, I mean, all architecture and all systems have uh, their pros and cons. So we have a democratic process where everyone who's trying to solve a problem, they generally write a spec around it and gets it reviewed by an open group. So any, any engineer can just probably join that group. And yeah, we have had uh, multiple fun arguments on that. Uh, fun is understating it. But uh, fun arguments on, on the, the way we are trying to solve the problem and way we explore uh, different solutions. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess that's 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 one thing that I've I've enjoyed over the the last five years is all all the arguments, and I mean that in a good way. In that we're we're open to question each other around the tech that we use, the way we do things, and um, have an open uh, conversation, stroke argument, and um, and come to a, a conclusion. Um, and that's it's quite a, a healthy relationship I think that we have internally in order to to do that. I guess we can come up to the last one minute. I guess a really quick one question. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's related to one of the features that we host. Uh, how are navigation related apps like Waze, delivery apps tested on Raw Stack? Uh, with, uh, Dimil, do you want to take on Join this us. one? Quick one. Join us will tell you the secret. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the short answer. But uh, I mean, to, to answer it honestly, let's say it's, it's, it's about uh, figuring out those APIs. Right? I've emphasized this multiple times in this discussions where you have to reverse engineer and see how those GPS or, or those location APIs work and uh, find the right hook to possibly tweak that API so that uh, it, it, it makes uh, it makes the right call so that a uh, customer's uh, apps are being tested. If you want more details, as I said, careers at browser.com. That's the place to go. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, I guess... Uh... Uh, I'll just just give me one second. I'll follow the convention, and here we are. Thanks, guys. Thanks for attending this session. Uh, I think we had a good turnout even for the Q and A session, uh, but we are running up on time. If uh, there are more questions or you want to contact us related to careers, you can definitely get in touch with the careers page on Browstack and. Uh, definitely do join us to solve much more interesting problems and challenges and be a part of this journey. Thanks guys. Bye.